Hello there. My name's Joe Bell and I'm so glad that you're able to join me today. We're looking at a series called Coping in a Crisis. And today we're going to have a look at the subject of living in lockdown with guilt. This recording comes to you from Silver Mine. It's a retirement village in Nurdok and uh, we're in Cape Town and it's great that you're able to be with me. And we've been looking at the subjects of doubt, of depression, anxiety, insecurity. And now today we look at living in lockdown with guilt. And we're going to have a look at Psalm 51. Because there we have a man after God's own heart who went astray and battled with the problem of guilt. In his book, Counseling Youth, Joss McDowell tells a very moving and disturbing story of a young boy of seven named Andrew. Andrew one morning got ready to go to school, walked out of the house, and as he was walking out, his mother said to him, Andrew, don't forget your coat. And he ignored her, went down the pathway, and his dad came to the front door with a coat in his hand and said, Andrew, your coat. But he saw the school bus coming down the road and he didn't want to miss it. And so he ignored his dad, got onto the bus, drove off, and as he looked back, he saw his father running down the road with his coat in his hand. And then he slipped on the ice, had a very, very nasty fall, cracked his head, and 11 days later, he died. Prior to that, Andrew had always been extremely cheerful, outgoing, charismatic personality. But the moment he died, his personality changed. He became dull, morose, moody. At 10, he was nearly knocked down in front of his house by a, a car going past. At 13, he had bouts of depression. At 15, he attempted to take his own life. After extensive examination and time with the psychiatrist, the doctor went to his mom and said to her that Andrew has and is consumed by intense guilt. He believes that he was guilty of his father's death. Guilt is one of the inescapable issues of life, isn't it? There are lots of people around today who have got uh, skeletons in their cupboard, memories of their past which bring a sense of shame, regret, embarrassment, humiliation and guilt. And whenever they think of their past, in fact, they actually blush. And it seems that so often in our past misdemeanors, they continuously resurface those indiscretions, rash behavior, reckless activities, careless actions, and they just won't go away. Now for a few moments, let's have a look at Psalm 51, written by a king, King David, perhaps the greatest king that Israel had ever had. He was a leader, a man amongst men. And during his time, he climbed the social ladder. He brought peace and prosperity to his country. They overcame their enemies. There were political structures in place that helped everybody. And the people loved David. He was revered and respected by all. And then one day, an event took place in his life 
that changed his situation forever. He seduced another man's wife. She fell pregnant and he ordered that the husband should go into the front lines of the battle and he lost his life. And during that time, I think David thought he'd keep the 11th commandment. Have the husband murdered? the wife married, the child adopted, and get on with life. But David was to learn that there is a verse in Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. He who covers his sin shall not prosper. And when you go through this psalm, you can see David wrestling with the emotions that plagued and troubled him. And I want to just share with you three thoughts. Number one, that there were his struggles. He writes in verse three and he tells us that his sin was always before him. He was, there was a waging in his soul, an inner conflict, turmoil of mind, depth of shame, intense grief, My sin is always before me, he said. Wherever he went, whatever he did, whether it was morning, noon or night, his sin was ever before him. Have you noticed in the world in which we find ourselves now that there is a tendency to cover up sin? What we do is we minimize it or we excuse it or we condone it or we even disregard it. But sin pays wages. I remember first coming into the ministry and I got a phone call at 2 a.m. in the morning from Esme. And Esme said, Joe, can you please come and help us? Stan has hit the bottle again. He's chased the children out. He's told me I have to leave and he's moving the furniture out into the street. And I went there at two o'clock in the morning. I'm not at my best at that time. And I grabbed him and took him into the lounge and put him down. And I said, Stan, I want you to know that we were all sick and tired of your behavior. You're a disgrace to your wife. You're embarrassing your children and your neighborhood are ashamed of your behavior. Then he turned to me and he said, would I mind listening to his story? And he told me how in World War II, he was in the British Navy and his job was to launch the torpedoes. And he said every time he launched a torpedo, He would wait to see if it hit the target and then there would be screeching metal and not long after that, men in the water screaming, crying for help, injured and drowning. And then they said one day a torpedo hit his ship and he found himself in the water and he said quite miraculously there was a piece of wood there and he grabbed hold of it and it was a, helped him to keep on the surface of the water and then one of his fellow seamen came badly injured and grabbed hold of the wood as well but it couldn't support both of them and Stan said do you know what I did said I pushed him off the wood he drowned I survived and now I live with guilt and the only way I can overcome it is to go to the bottle to try and forget those memories. Now, beloved, you and I are not involved like David or Stan, but we too have our moments 
And maybe while you in quarantine or this lockdown situation or seclusion or isolation, you have found that there are issues in your life that have surfaced and they plague your mind. You look back and you're reminded over and over again of things that you've said, letters that you've written, an involvement in which you found yourself, and those things that you did that were wrong, that were deceitful, that were sinful, and even evil. And perhaps because of your behavior, people have been hurt, relationships have been shattered, family, friends, and your future have received a severe blow, and your sins, like David, are ever before you. And there was this struggle that took place continuously in his life. My sin is ever before me. And I want you to notice, secondly, his desire. Verse 10 tells us that he wrote and asked God also to create within him a clean heart. David knew that he had defiled Bathsheba. He had murdered her husband, disgraced his family, dishonored the nation. However, above all else, David knew that his sin was a revolt against God. That's, beloved, what makes sin so serious, so distressing, so severe. God is not some impersonal energy or a material object or a hand-carved image. God is a moral being, a compassionate father, a righteous judge, a sovereign Lord. And every time we sin, we sin against God. And we find that in today's world, there are those people who do confess their sin. But really, all they're exercising is their wounded pride. You hear people say, you know, I let myself down. I should have known better. I'm so angry with myself. I really acted stupidly. And they've got feelings of remorse and regret and reproach and guilt. But beloved, that's not good enough. It's not good enough to be angry with ourselves because we need to know that God is angry. God is grieved. God is distressed. God is suffering when we give way to sin. But here was David desiring above all else God's forgiveness. He desired God's absolution. He desired God's cleansing, God's restoration. Create in me a clean heart, O God. That was his desire. And so we have his struggle. My sin is ever before me. We have his desire. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And we have, beloved, his restoration. He writes in verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. In his depths of shame and embarrassment and humiliation and disgrace, David knew that his only hope was the unfailing love of God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. His confidence was in the unfailing love of God, the love of God that is free, that is spontaneous, that is uninfluenced, that is inseparable, that is patient. And where is God's unfailing love best demonstrated? At the cross. 
See, we've got to ask ourselves, how does a holy, righteous, sinless God justify an adulterer, a murderer, a liar, a hypocrite, a transgressor at the cross, at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the unfailing love of God. It's at the cross that the just one died for the unjust, that the righteous one died for the unrighteous, the innocent one for the guilty, for the sinless one for the sinful. At the cross, Jesus became sin. He became a curse. He paid the price. And it was also on the cross that he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he took your sin and mine and endured the wrath of his Father, the anger, the displeasure. See, what we've got to realize is this, that sin doesn't just evaporate or disappear or vanish or fade away. The Lord Jesus took it all upon himself and he bore our sin and the judgment of God upon himself. Now, it may be that as you've been listening to this message, there is a war in your soul today. Some issue, some problem, or some affair or conflict or habit or weakness or obsession that has gripped you. In fact, it may be so very personal, you would never share it with anybody in the world. And Satan is coming at you again and again and again. He's on the warpath. And you in this intense struggle. It's taking place day after day. And those memories and those thoughts and all that you've done just comes to your mind and to your heart over and over and over again. It was on the 4th of June in 1940. The British people were taking an awful battering during the war. The Air Force, the Navy, the Army were under great pressure. And their Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, got up to address the House of Commons and the people. And in the course of that very moving speech of his, he happened to say this, we will fight them on the beaches, in the fields, in the streets, in the hills, but we shall never, never, never surrender. And beloved, with the Lord Jesus dwelling within us, accompanying us and leading us and sustaining us and cleansing us and being with us, with his help, we are able to overcome the guilt and the sin and the past and all of those things that weigh us down. And as you and I are in lockdown now and we're living with this guilt, I want to make a suggestion to you. Let's take a walk to Calvary. Let's take a walk to Golgotha, the place of the skull. Let's take a walk to that area where the Lord Jesus was crucified for you and me. And beloved, he not only died for our sin, it was there on the cross that he overcame the devil. 
And as the Lord Jesus comes into your life and mine, he helps us to overcome the devil's fiery darts, those subtle temptations, that subversive attack, those crafty screams. But with the help of the Lord Jesus, we may never, never, never surrender. Won't you come with me now? Let's take a walk to the Lord Jesus and bow our hearts and our heads and ask him to be with us. You might like to pray your own prayer or you might like to echo the words that I'm going to pray and call upon the Lord Jesus to be with us during this time of lockdown as we're battling with our guilt. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you went to the cross for me. Thank you that you disarmed Satan's power for me. Thank you that you conquered him for me. I ask you now to remove my guilt, my stain, my sin. And won't you wash me, cleanse me, restore me, renew me for your glory and honour. And may I never, never surrender. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been great to have you. If this message has been a blessing to you, may I ask you to just share it with your friends or family or acquaintances, wherever it might be, with a prayer in the hope and the trust that God will bless them as well. May you have a wonderful day and may the blessing of God be with you. And I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, to strengthen you, and to settle you in the faith. For Jesus' sake. Amen.